week. If you were here, the topic we looked at was the idea of social justice. And uh, the, the big idea from last week was in the culture right now, there is idolatry on the political right and idolatry on the political left. And Christ doesn't call us to be right-wing Christians or left-wing Christians. He calls us to be Christians. Um, and so that was the gist of last week. So today we're looking at a specific issue related to justice, the issue of race. Um, is this issue controversial in the Tuck culture? Obviously, people can be very heated on different sides of particular issues. Does the church get accused of wrongdoing on this issue? Yes, because the church has been involved in wrongdoing on this issue, um, particularly the American church. Um, and so because we're, look, we're trying to engage lost people with the gospel, this is an area we need to, we need to think well and think hard about. Um, but I think when you talk about has the church messed up when it comes to race, we do have to specify which church and when. Um, because the historic global church has actually been one of the greatest sources of ethnic unity in world history. The American church, the Western church, has had some horrendous missteps over the years, but also some great victories. So we'll, we'll kind of try to sort through some of the wheat and the chaff. Um, also, maybe three weeks ago at Vertical, we had the Sermon on Human Dignity. Do you remember when we did a history lesson? We said Tom Holland, not the Spider-Man, but the historian Tom Holland. One of the big ideas there is that throughout Christian history, the, our movement, the movement of people bearing the name of Jesus, has shined the brightest and also crashed the hardest around issues of race and ethnicity. So it's both where we've done horrible and where we've really transformed the world in some ways. And so today what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a short kind of biblical teaching on racial, racial unity, the Bible and race, the Bible and ethnicity. Uh, and then we'll do Q&A for most of the rest of the time. So first point I want to share, and this is just personal, but BSM, we really do want to be positive and proactive on the issue of racial reconciliation. Um, we, we're trying, and some years we do better than others, sometimes we do better than others. Uh, we work to have a multi-ethnic ministry. We want diverse people. And I love that even in this room, there's people who with heritages from all over the world. Um, diverse people can be equipped and empowered in Christ to be witnesses for him. That's our heart. Um, also, we got to admit, race at UTA is interesting, right? Because sometimes the conversation in American culture, it's, it revolves around black and white. But at UTA, did you know that um, less than half of the campus is black and white. And over half the campus is Hispanic and Asian. And so we have, not, we have not a black and white campus, but every shade of the rainbow is our campus. And we love it, and it's beautiful. Um, we will talk a bit about the African-American experience in American culture because it is very unique. Um, but if you're a student in this ministry, which I think all y'all but Al are, um, we want you to speak up, like if you're, especially if you're a student of color, if you're a student from another ethnic background, um, we want you to tell us what would make your experience here better, how what would help us reach um, people better. So speak up, we need you. So, um, and then before we jump in the scripture, text to scripture, um, we love Jesus. We absolutely love Jesus. He's our king who left heaven on high, came to earth to save us. But y'all realize Jesus wasn't white, right? doesn't matter what the picture in my grandma's house on her wall said. Jesus was an olive-skinned Middle Eastern man who lived in Africa for a while. Um, Judaism, the, the, the religion that Jesus was born into, the heritage that God used to bring him into the world, Judaism was an ethnic religion. Judaism was for the Jews. That was what they thought. But why did God send Jesus to the place that he did at the time that he did? You know, it was a unique moment in history. Galatians 4.4 4 said that it was in the fullness of all time when Jesus came. And it was interesting, that speck of land where he was born was the meeting place of three continents. Africa, Asia, Europe met in that spot. And Jesus came at the very beginning of what we call the Roman peace, 200 years 
where those three continents were united by an empire that had roads, that had a common language. So that message could start there in that moment. And it was the only time in history before then and for a long time after then where the message could start there and quickly reach diverse people from, like the Great Commission says, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Revelation 7, 9 says. And so God's vision from the beginning, it's our next point, God's eternal plan was to create a multi-ethnic, multinational people united in Christ. So on your handout, we'll jump into some scriptures. Um, from the very beginning, our identity in Christ, this is going to be kind of a whirlwind tour of the, the Bible and race. From the beginning, our identity in Christ supersedes our ethnic, our social, and our gender identities. In American culture right now, there's an attempt to divide people into tribes, political tribes, ethnic tribes, like is the, is the dress gold and, gold and whatever or blue and whatever tribes. Like, like there's, there's all these different ways to, to split people up. The purpose Jesus came was to unite people who normally would be divided. It's one of the purposes of Christ, to reconcile us to God and reconcile us to fellow humans who, where there are barriers. So Galatians 3, 26, 29, we've read this at Vertical a couple weeks ago, but it's a powerful passage, and it's about identity. If you're a Christian, this is about you. It says, so in Christ, you're all children of God through faith, all children of God through faith, for you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And I love the picture that we're in Christ. Christ is in us. We're wrapped in Christ. Our identity, everything about us, if we're a Christian, we have different identities. Like you're a son or a daughter of your parents. You're a citizen of the country you were born in. You're studying the major you're studying. You've got the hobbies that you've got. But if you're in Christ, that identity far exceeds any other earthly identity that you have. And in the days of Jesus, people divided into different identities. They had social identities, cultural identities, socioeconomic identities, language, ethnic identities. And so look at verse 28. Paul says, for there is neither Jew nor Greek. Those are ethnic groups. He says, Christ, the gospel divides or demolishes ethnic differences. There's neither slave nor free. That's social class. We might, we might say rich and poor. We might say middle class and lower class. Those divisions go away in Christ. There's neither male nor female gender differences, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed according to the promise. We are not American Christians. If you're American, I know you're not all that. We're Christians who happen on a much lower level to be American. There's some people who describe themselves as Republican Christians or Democratic Christians or progressive Christians. You're a Christian. And whatever, however you vote, whatever your socioeconomic level, whatever your racial background is, that's part of who you are. But compared to knowing Christ, it's a much less important part of who you are. Uh, maybe one way to think about it like this is you have infinitely more in common with a poor Vietnamese villager on a fishing boat somewhere. You have infinitely more in common with an African tribesman who worships Jesus than with your neighbor who looks exactly like you, votes like you, maybe occasionally attends church with you, but doesn't know Jesus. So next point. Every human being is made in God's image and created to relate to God and represent Him. We've talked about the image of God over and over. And every human being shares, has that stamped on them. That is part of what it means to be human, is that dignity of, that comes from being commonly human, made in the image of God. But sin shatters human relationships. And it causes hostility between individuals. It causes hostility among groups. And it breaks our relationship with God. Remember the story of the garden and the fall. So how many people were on earth at this point in the garden? How's the story go? Two, Adam and Eve. How, how did they get along? 
pretty great. He just sang her a song, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. You're, I'd really like you. It's, it's Gary's translation of Genesis, into Genesis 2. They have perfect communion with each other and with God. It says that God would come in the cool of the morning and walk in the garden with them. It's this beautiful picture of humans in harmony with each other and with God. And God says, total freedom to do whatever you want, but one rule, don't rebel against me. And they rebel against God. But the rebellion, look at what it does. It didn't just break their relationship with God. It did that. They get kicked out of the garden. It also says when they disobeyed, they ate that fruit. It said their eyes were open and they looked down and they became ashamed that they were naked and they covered themselves up so Eve couldn't see Adam and Adam couldn't see Eve's body. And it caused distance not just between people and God, but between people and each other. So when we look at the world and we see people at odds with each other, family conflict and strife, ethnic conflict and strife, that's a result of sin that's in the human heart. And so, so sin shatters human relationships. You keep reading in Genesis, you get to chapter 11, Tower of Babel. Remember that story? All the people on earth spoke a common language. It said they basically put their heads together and they said, let's build a city. Let's build a tower that shows how amazing we are so we can bring glory to ourselves. And it said because of their pride, because of their hubris, God confused their languages, he dispersed them, and it, part of what's going on here is this is the Bible's explanation for why people are, um, are divided into separate ethnicities, different cultural and language groups, and it says that that's also a result of human sin. And so Babel tells us that human sin further fractures human society. Um, I, I can't, I, don't think, I can't remember if this is on your handout, but one thing you don't see in Scripture is what we, when we think of race, when we use the word race, what do we typically think of? Like when, when, I, say, when I say this race or that race, what do we typically mean when we say race? We think of melanin level. We think of skin tone. That concept of race is nowhere to be found in Scripture. Um, it, it, it is, you know... The idea of a race as a social construct is true. The Bible has a strong, um, talks about ethnic identity, different cultural group, language groups divided by geographic region, people with different customs, people divided by different boundaries, people who have different nuances in their understanding of the world. But what we think of as race based on skin tone, um, if anything, it has more, it's based more in we could get into history at another time, but it's really based more in modern um, Darwinistic theories. It's based more on a colonial understand desire to have a caste system where we could have people enslaved under us, um, but it's not a biblical thing. Uh, moving on. God didn't want to leave it broken the way it was. So in Genesis 12... He introduces his rescue plan, and he says, I'm going to start with one man, Abraham. And so God takes this one man, Abraham, he pulls him out of polytheistic religion, and he says, Abraham, I've chosen you to start a plan to bring a savior into the world. And so in Genesis 12, 13, he's, give, he's describing this plan to Abra Abram, and he says, I will bless those who bless you, whoever curses you, I'll curse and part of his rescue plan to bring a savior who will cure the sin problem of mankind is he says in every nation, every people, every ethnic group on earth will be blessed through you. We see from the very beginning God's design wasn't to create, wasn't to have one treasured nationality, but to unite people from every nation under the banner of Christ. From the beginning, God's plan. He wanted Israel to be... Uh, a light to the nations of the world. He wanted Israel to point all the different ethnicities and nations to Yahweh God. Um, even if you look at the design of the temple in the Old Testament, if you, you can look up a diagram of it, and it's this really cool design with concentric circles. So there, there's this one area where only the high priest could go only one day of the year, the Holy of Holies. And there's a holy place where priests could go daily, but only priests. 
then outside this court is a, is a place where priests can congregate for their service to make sacrifices. Outside of that, only Jewish men. Outside of that, a court, Jewish men and women. But outside of that, the biggest court in the temple was what they called the court of nations. And people, and, and, and people from no matter what their ethnic background were meant to be able to come and bring their sacrifices and worship God. But the Jews turned it into a marketplace and they made it a place where diverse people didn't come to worship. They, they sort of neglected their call to reconcile the nations to God. Um, and Jesus came in. Uh, and if you remember, Jesus quoted Isaiah 56, 6 through 7. The passage is here. And he says, for my house is to be called a house of prayer for who? For all the nations. And so Isaiah said that 700 years before Jesus. And when Jesus was kicking out the money changers from the court of the nations, he quoted the prophecy, this is supposed to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Um, there's all sorts of fun facts about race in the Bible. Uh, Matthew's genealogy, do you know the Gospel of Matthew, first book in the New Testament, first chapter, it's the most, the genealogy, we tend to think of it as the most boring part of the Bible, right? So-and-so had, had this child who had this child who had this child, and it just traces it. Matthew does a funny thing, and he lists four women in the lineage of Jesus. So when God chose to bring Jesus into the world, he lists four women. Do you know what the four women had in common? How many of them were Jews? None. Matthew makes the point that Jesus arriving on earth, Jesus was a product of four interracial marriages. And Matthew was a Jew, and he's writing to the Jews, but he's making the point that Jesus isn't a savior of some people. He's a savior of all people. It's a cool little, cool little thing that he sneaks in. Jesus is going to affirm that explicitly when he gives the Great Commission. And he says, uh, Jesus' commission was for the disciples to build the church with people from every ethnic group. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the, Father, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in these concentric circles of identity. Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, where the Jews live. Judea, where the Jews live. Samaria, where the non-Jews live. And then to the uttermost parts of the world. That's our commission as Christians, is not to take the gospel just to our people, but to all people. And then here's a cool one, next to last one. Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 is the birthday of the church, the day the church was born. What was the miracle that God performed at Pentecost? It said the Holy Spirit descended like tongues of fire, it rested on everybody. And what was the miracle? They all preached, but what did people hear? The gospel in whatever language they spoke in their heart. Think about the, the fracture that the Tower of Babel caused. Human sin caused people to be divided into these ethnic tribal identities. The, the, the miracle on the birthday of the church was those language tribal identities being reconciled by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So what Babel ruined... Pentecost started bringing back together. Then, Revelation 7, 9, a picture of heaven. Whenever we do our job and we take the gospel along with brothers and sisters to the ends of the earth, a picture of heaven, John says, and I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language standing before the throne and the Lamb. They were there wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hand. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, let me do about three more minutes, two more minutes. We had longer, we'd talk about slavery in the Bible. There was slavery in the Old Testament. There was slavery in the New Testament. Um, slavery was a universal practice in basically every ancient culture. Y'all know it's still practiced today in some cultures, some parts of the world, um, overtly. It's still covertly through human trafficking. Did the Old Testament prohibit slavery? No and yes. Um, the Old Testament forbade buying and selling humans. It was forbidden in the Old Testament. But, um, and, and even though no other culture...
prohibited that, the Old Testament prohibited that, it did allow for some forms of what we might call indentured service. Um, What about the New Testament? Well, one thing we've got to recognize is that both the New Testament church was a persecuted minority. They did not have the power to tell the emperor of Rome, get rid of it. Also, Roman slavery was really complex, and it ranged everywhere from horrendous, like American chattel slavery was, all the way to slaves who were basically household members that just worked in the house and were unpaid, considered family, had the checkbook to the house and did business for the family. So it was much more diverse than American slavery was. And so the New Testament treatment of it was more nuanced than than American pastors should have been. Did Western slaveholders claim to be Christian? Far too often, yes, it was horrendous. It was the original sin of America. We need to be honest and mournful about that fact. Some Christians use their faith to justify the practice, and we reject that. Um, Some of the most revered Christian leaders in American history condone slavery. Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield condone slavery. However, other Christian leaders who we respect deeply were aggressively opposed to it. John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon are some examples, um, and many were, many actually of the abolitionists were Christians who did that because of their Christian faith. Two last theological points, sin. What is sin? Sometimes we've talked, we've talked about how American culture is very individualistic, number one in the world, and we can tend to say sin is only me committing a personal offensive act to God. Um, And the Bible agrees with that. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner because I sin. Um, Individual racism is a personal sin. When I have malice in my heart, or like James talks about favoritism, repudiating the image of God in another person, that is an individual sin. But the Bible also talks about societal sins, where whole cultures can sin against whole groups of people. Um, sometimes in our in modern language, people talk about systemic injustice, or I'll, I like the I like the word societal sin. The Bible talks about that. Sometimes is God punished the whole nation of Israel, men and women and children, because of sin of its leaders. Sometimes God used Israel to punish whole nations because of the sin that was in that culture. And so the Bible uses it doesn't just talk about individual sin. It also doesn't just talk about societal sin. It talks about both. And sometimes people in American culture, especially who are, we could be a little blunt here, people who are on the kind of the right side of the political spectrum tend to emphasize personal sin and say, but societal sin isn't a real thing. People who are on the left side of the political divide tend to emphasize societal sin and don't talk about personal sin. But what does the Bible talk about? It talks about both. It does. Um, it's funny because most, many of my conservative friends who are kind of pushing back against the idea of societal sin, uh, they don't have a problem calling abortion a societal sin. We talked about that last week, right? In abortion, it's like an individual sin. It's somebody killing another person. But it's also like abortion, it's entrenched into laws. It's entrenched into like understandings that people have about what the unborn is, the ways who the unborn are, how we think about it, a cheap view of life, legal structures, Roe versus Wade. So we don't have a problem saying that that's systemically unjust. Um, but for some reason, some people have a problem saying that it is. Also, people on the left have a hard time saying that individual sin um, is sin. And then last, individual sin, societal sin. Biblical justice includes both retribution and restoration. This is, this is an idea that figures into conversations around race in America, but in the Bible, justice is both retribution. If somebody steals from you, they should get arrested. But justice is also restoration. If somebody steals from you, they ought to pay it back if they can. And so it is a compli- complicated question what that means when it comes to race in America. I don't pretend that Al and I are going to adjudicate it in the next two or three minutes, but it is part of the conversation around justice. So with no further ado, would y'all welcome Al Curley, um, and we're going to do a little Q&A. As Al comes up, I'll, make, I'll, I'll say kind of two quick things. One is 
we just need to talk about racial tension in the country. Like it does not serve us well when we ignore it. Um, and so we need to talk about it. Um, and we need to get way beyond political categories of right and left. Because so many times how Christians frame their opinion about race is based on whether they vote Republican or Democrat. And so because my party feels this way, I've got to feel this way. And because my party feels this way, I've got to feel this way. And as Christians, we ought to be countercultural and not let either party determine how we feel about the issue. So, Al, thanks for being here today. So I guess first thing, I just love to give Al open mic to say anything he has to say about, um, like Al, you're a, you're a pastor in a great church uh, that has done really well on these issues. I think he's been a good voice for it. Uh, what would you add? What would you add to what has been said here? What would you correct in my uh, frail, fragile, terrible <laughs> explanation of race in the Bible? Open mic. You got it. Um. First, I think the presentation was uh, great. I don't know if I can correct Gary on much of anything, really. Um, but I think one thing I'll say, and I don't want to take too much time saying this, is that it's important that we talk about matters of race, right? So when I'm saying that, for example, in an instance like this, in a scenario like this, in a situation like this, an environment like this, I think is admirable of the fact that we're able to address this or mention this or bring some light to this and do it in a biblical way, rooted in scripture as to what does the Bible say about the way that we engage one another? What does the Bible say about, you know, being made in the image of God? What does the Bible say um, about all nations or, you know, for example, like the one blood doctrine in, in, in Acts, right? We're all like one blood kind of. And then we come from Adam um, and all those things. And what I'm trying to get at is that at the foundation of our conceptions about race, we have to make sure that we gird that in being willing to have conversation about race. And when I'm saying that, those conversations need to be intentionally had with individuals who might not have the same perspective. Yep. It might not look the same. Yep. So I'll leave it there and then we can go further from there. Yeah. But great, great presentation. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that. Um, talk to me practically um, what can what can a group like this or a, a church do in, in your estimation what are the healthy things we could do to, to strive for racial reconciliation within our groups or even between diverse groups do you have any like practical tips for how Christian individual Christians or even a group like ours um, could strive for racial reconciliation yeah so um I'm going to kind of use the model that when we when we first met that you kind of heard us go through Oza and I yeah, please. all these L's we like use love lament learn listen all that kind of stuff yeah. so those are practical things that we can do and I can kind of walk through walk through them real quickly so at the at the at the onset I want to say love I want to say love as the first thing okay and it might be obvious to say why um but I think love should be the priority because it's a it's a commandment. It's a great commandment that we love one another as Christ loves us, as God loves us, right? And so nothing else matters if you don't have the love ethic as at the center. Because the listening won't be effective if I don't love that individual that I'm listening to. Now you might say, now that I don't I don't understand because not everybody who I listen to I love. I have professors that I have to listen to, but I don't necessarily love yeah. them, right? But we're not talking about on a professor student level. We're talking about on a human level, right? And if we're talking about on a human level, we have a responsibility as human beings to love one another. It's what we're instructed to, to do in scripture. So first, we have to love well. Then I want to say that we have to listen well. Okay? Now, not listen to respond. A lot of times, especially in the world of academia, we listen to respond. I'm listening because I know that a test is coming. I'm listening because I know that an exam is on the way. Or I'm listening because I know that I'm going to be in a debate with somebody eventually about something I'm supposed to be learning, and I want to be prepared for that. Right? 
But when we talk about human to human interactions, I think the best type of listening is a listening to understand. So now when you get into the more serious relationships of life, not to you know, demean any relationships that you're in right now because you might be in some important relationships. And if you're in those important relationships, you know the value of listening, right? So I was introduced to Gary's wonderful wife who is over there in the red and black shirt. Can we give it up for her one time, right? <laughs> right, and I'm sure, you know, they've been married for an extended period of time and I've been married, but not, not necessarily as, not nearly as long as they have. They have more experience than we do, right? And I'm sure that they can testify that listening is a valid part of a successful relationship. Very valid. Yeah. Yes, right? And I'm, I'm learning that, and I'm sure Gary's learning that as well, that listening, listening to understand, not listening so that I can make my point after you finish talking, but listening to understand where you're coming from. Because if you're listening to make a point or you're listening to rebut or anything like that, you might miss the heart of what somebody's saying. Because maybe in their expression to you, they, they've been through so much or whatever the case may be, and they've lived in that experience. So as they're expressing it to you, they'll just go, 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 go. But if you're listening to understand, you might be able to say, wow, there was a point there that I don't even think that they realized that connects to this point, that connects to this point, which kind of shapes their experience. So now as a brother in Christ, as a sister in Christ, how can I, as a part of their life now, positively engage them based on what I understand about what they've shared, okay? And I'm going to kind of, I don't want to take too much time. No, please. So what have we done? Love, we've done listen. And when you listen to understand, what you're now doing is you're learning, okay? That's the next L, to learn. And you can't learn by just listening to respond. That doesn't change actions by just listening to respond. Listening to understand allows you to significantly learn. Now, learning is a time-consuming experience. Why you say that, Al? I'm saying that because one conversation is not gonna get it done. So we might do things, you know, we get in this, this college life, right? It's a lot of checking off the boxes, right? I go to this class to check off a box, my attendance, right? I take this class to check off a box on my curriculum. I take this curriculum to check off a box to get the degree. I get this degree to check off a box to get this job, right? I get the, this job to check off a box to get the salary, so forth and so on, right? You guys understand what I'm saying? But I don't, I, I, wanna, I wanna be sure to say that we wanna make sure that our human to human interactions, regardless of race, ethnicity, background, cultural experience, is not checking off a box. I'm sitting down, Gary, I'm sitting down with Al so that they can say that I've had conversation with black people. I'm sitting down with Gary so that I can say I've had conversation with white people. No, there has to be an intentional learning. And oftentimes what you'll see is that intentional learning and that sitting in the experience. Like if you get into like a doctoral program that takes you overseas to study a culture, you can't do it in a week. You can't do it in a weekend. I know somebody that has a doctoral project in some kind of Chinese, whatever the case may be, I don't remember offhand, but she had to spend years in China learning the culture, learning the language, learning the stories, and learning somebody's story is not just I sit and tell you about my story. Sometimes learning my story is living with me and experiencing that story and seeing my relationship to that experience. Yeah. So we got love, we've got um, listen, we've got learn, and then lament. And I, I think I'll end after the lament. I don't even remember what the last one was. Um, <laughs> lament, right? Because you're able to, now it's not like it's a, you gotta do this first, do this, do this. I'm not saying that. I'm just, just in the organization of how I have it in my mind, right? So if you, if you love well, if you've listened well, for you to learn well, you should be able to empathize for somebody's situation, causing you to lament with. The Bible says we weep with those who weep, we cry with those who are crying, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. If something tragic happens in Gary's life, I should be able to empathize with that situation to say, you know what? 
Gary, you're not in it by yourself. You know what? That, that situation is very hard for you. But you know what? Because I love you, it's hard for me too. And we're going to bear this burden together. The Bible tells us to bear one another's burdens in love, right? And then in the good times, you know, like your friend does something phenomenal and great. You guys want to party. You guys want to celebrate together because you're just as excited for their accomplishment as they are. And that's how it should be. When we're talking to people of different cultures and backgrounds, we hear that story that's heart-wrenching. We shouldn't walk away from that saying, oh, well, that's not my culture, so it is what it is. I feel bad for him, whatever. There should be a burden within us that says, that's my brother in Christ, that's my sister in Christ. Or they may not even know Christ yet, but that burden for them to know God in Christ, to have that love of Christ soothe their aching heart. And how can you be a conduit for that? So what do we have? We have um, love, listen, learn. Lament. That's kind of a, a strategy as to practical things that we can do. That's good. I'm going to edit out the video. We're going to edit out everything before that, and that's just going to be the teaching for today. <laughs> Please really don't good. do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> okay. Let's, we've got 10, 10 minutes or so left. I'd love to just open it up for any questions you guys have, just practical questions. Um, that I'll, I'll be happy to take them, or the expert, <laughs> Pastor Reverend Al, is here. But tell me what questions y'all have that you'd like to ask on this topic. Anybody jot something down? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. All of those races and even my perspective and what I've um, ultimately tried. Well, the thing, the word that I really kind of focus on was like white privilege. And then like, if you see the media, they're like all these left people saying they're like, extreme white privilege in America and all these like red people saying, well, it's not about the white privilege, but it's more about the, like culture and stuff. So they're like constantly fighting. I just want to know what do you think about the white privilege? Is it like even real? And if so, like where do you want us to like stand for that one? Do you want it or you want me to well, you can You can start <laughs> off. <laughs> so, if you were here last week, one of our sayings was two things can be true at the same time. And that word has become polarized, politicized, right? That phrase has become politicized. So are there certain parts of American culture, many parts of American culture, where the sort of the, the European influence on America is just seen as what's normal and Anything that isn't that is seen as, like, strange and foreign and not good. W yeah, that's white privilege. Um, some people even use the word white supremacy because, like, white culture is what's good and everything else is, like, uh. um, and, and so some people, we need to be able to admit that, like, maybe America does have, like, people on the right need to be able to say, there are some ways that people who are not part of white culture can be marginalized because of what we just consider normal. Um, there may be certain privileges afforded because of historic discrimination. Um, you know, Al and I didn't even get into kind of historic practices after the Civil War, like um, redlining and loan, discriminatory loan practices that have kept the average wealth of an African-American family very low. Um, compared to the average wealth of another wealthy African Americans or poor whites, but there have been certain privileges afforded to not every white person, but culture-wide to people. So people on the right need to be able to recognize there is such a thing as white privilege, and people on the left need to be able to say, but it's also not everything, and it's not a bat to beat down people who have one skin tone. Uh, that's a terrible answer, but I would love for I you think, to I think I think that gets us started in the right direction to, to say that, okay, so if we do a historical line, as, a, as Gary was alluding to, there are practices, there are laws that have, been input, that have been put in place, right, based on race that favor one side over another. So if the question is, historically, has there been white supremacy, the answer would be yes. And if that's the case, with white supremacy comes white privilege. What's the point of you deeming yourself supreme if there's no privilege that comes along with that, right? Now, that, that's the logical train of thought. So, yes, both of those things do exist. What Gary is saying is very important to understand that you're not monolithic in your view 
of these things as if to say that, as, as we were talking about earlier, one entire group of people are all bad because of this concept that we've brought about to extract events in not only human history, but American history as well. Now, if you're gonna analyze American history, it is clear that those things have been evident even up until the present day when you have instances of mass incarceration or the length of sentences, you can have individuals that are brought up on the same charges doing the same thing. And if you look in a certain way, it's, it's documented and shown that you might get a longer sentence if you're a person of color than if you're a white person, right? So now that's a certain level of discrimination which presents a certain privilege. Now, even if both of them end up in prison, the white person who ends up in prison for less time is like, there's no privilege, I'm still going to jail. But if you are going to jail for a lesser sentence, there is a privilege there. Now, I want to undergird that in this statement. And I want, I want everyone here to listen to this statement and hear this statement. There is also American privilege that holds up white privilege, if you want to consider that, right? American supremacy, right? Which sometimes can be, sometimes, hear me, sometimes can be masked in patriotism, right? Which causes you to discriminate against somebody else because they're not from your nation, they're not, I mean, Texas, I mean, don't throw stones at me. Texas is good for that, right? Like, Texans, we're the Americans, and all this great stuff. And that might be great to have pride, yeah. but then when that pride puts somebody else down, we have to be careful about that. I mean, this is a long way, Gary, to answer this yeah. question, but I hope that answers your question, that those things are real, and it has been shown historically, it has been shown in laws passed by American government and American society, and even in culture, like Jim Crow and all that kind of stuff. It, co it creates a culture of supremacy for a particular person against another. I'll give you this quick, this quick story, right? I was um, going to a grocery store. Uh, if you're from New York, we call them bodegas and corner stores, right? So we were going to the corner store, me and one of my friends, who I was with the other day. He was at my son's dedication. Um, we were at the corner store, and I don't know what happened before we got there. There was this guy there, and a police officer came in, came in very aggressively, right? And he starts coming at me and my friend assuming that we stole something from the store. Now, this is the store down the street from our school. We live in this neighborhood, right? So we're here all the time. Uh, we've never had anything like this happen to us. So he starts asking the guy behind the counter, these guys are stealing from this store, right? These guys are stealing from this store. The guy behind the counter says, no, they're not. Like, they just walked in. We were literally at the counter. This is the crazy thing. We were at the counter about to pay for what we were getting. If you're stealing, why would you come to the counter to pay? That doesn't make sense. We were at the counter. That's where he caught us, at the counter, trying to pay for what we had. And he's like, no, I know you guys are stealing because somebody in this area was stealing whatever, 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 right? And we're like, no. Now, I'm getting heated. I didn't have, you know, a lot of, I don't have a lot of patience now, but I really didn't have a lot of patience back then. So, like, I'm going at it with the officer. I'm like, you don't, I don't know you. You don't know me. You're not from here. This is my, this is like my town. What are you talking about? Because then he says something that really, I guess it, trauma, it was traumatic for me. He was like, I never want to see you guys in this store again. Mind you, this is the store down the street yeah. from my high school in the neighborhood that I kind of spent a majority of my life in with one of my brothers, my best friends, right? Did not doing anything wrong, just trying to get some snacks and go home. And this guy who we've never seen before, probably not from the neighborhood, tells me what I cannot do can and cannot do in my neighborhood. It's not like he took the time to get to know us. He didn't try to learn us. He wasn't trying to love us. He wasn't listening to what I was saying to him or what the person behind the counter was saying to him. He saw a narrative that probably played out in his mind many times before and went with that. So that brings about prejudice and discrimination, which are traits, white supremacy and uh, white privilege and all that kind of stuff. So, and I still remember that to this day. And it was a traumatic experience for me because it, it created a rage and a frustration within me to say, what if he decided to arrest me or whatever the case may be? What power would I have if he thinks that he can come into a neighborhood that I grew up in to a store that I always go to and tell me that he never wants to see me there again? Now, 
I went, I, of course, have gone back to the store plenty of times. But just the way that moment made me feel, right? So let's consider that because it doesn't have to be as overt as a police officer saying, I never want you to do this again. But it can be the conversations that we have that bring about certain things embedded in us, maybe consciously or subconsciously, that offend another person and say, okay, you think that we're different. As human beings, you think that you have certain rights and privileges that I don't have. Yeah, that's good. I, w I, would, I, I would add to that, um, it, it shouldn't surprise us that our culture has set itself up in this way if we're Christians and believe that the human heart is sinful. Like, we're always looking out for number one. Um, and to say, that, uh, to say that America has some st structural problems isn't to say that other countries don't. Right. Um, I've traveled to a few other countries. I've been to. I've spent some time in China, and I can't. I can't remember if Daniel's here or not. Um, but he would agree with me. China's a really a racist country. I mean, they've got a million Muslims, ethnic, ethnic, uh, of another ethnicity in concentration camps right now. That's structural racism, also. Um, and so to say that America has it isn't to say America's bad and every other country is good. It's just saying. Part, part of lament is to say we want to be better than we are. Right. And so we want to do better than we have. Yeah. And I, I grew up, uh, my, the little town I grew up in, I don't know if I ever told you this, uh, we had one black family. Mm. There's 800 people in the town. We had well, the Hunters were the only black family. When I was in school, there were no black children in the whole school, K through 12. Mm. Um, but it was about 70% Hispanic. Okay. Um, but I would watch um, ways in which m my Hispanic friends were held back. Some by their own culture. Oh, you're trying to get good grades. There's like a cultural pressure to not get good grades, mm -hmm. like because you're being white. Uh, but also, if a guy wants to get a loan for a small business at the bank, there'd be some reason mm -hmm. that he wasn't going to. And so it's not to say, uh, I think as Christians, we should say, because we know the human heart is sinful, we should expect to see this whenever we, when we look for it. We got time for one or two more questions. We can go a little long. I've had my entire like experience with um, just being like marginalized racially, but I've also um, had to just within my own heart towards other races. What would you say? Um, or what could be like a practical way for me to, um, I guess, like to not do that or to, to avoid like having prejudice or having like stereotypes in my own heart? Yeah, um, the, the first thing I want to say, a lot of times when we think practically, or when we say that we're practical, we negate spiritual things as if that's not practical. So the first thing I want to say is that you need to continue to pray about those things, bring those things before God and lament over those things. It should bring you to a point where you're not okay with the way that you respond in certain instances where you're being stereotypical or whatever the case may be. That should cause a feeling within you, it should cause a rage in you that desires you to radically change, right? So, you know, the Bible says, if my people were called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, right? So, it's not enough to pray about it if you're not willing to turn away from it. So, that intense prayer and supplication to God to take this, like you're praying to God to take away a sinful desire, right? Bring that to God like a sinful desire. God, I want to love people the way that you love people. I want to see people through your through a godly lens and not a lens that's been taught to me by a biased culture or anything like that. That's a practical thing you can do. One. Two, if you know individuals who are a part of the culture who you feel biased against, remember what we were talking about in those L's. You have to be intentional to do those L's, to love and to listen and to, you know, lament with and to learn from them, right? It's difficult. It, this might not even make sense to say. It's difficult to hate somebody that you love. If you love them, I mean, you might, you might hate things that they do, but you don't hate the individual. You spend time with somebody, you've had meals with somebody, you know, and that might be a effort that you have to do. You know what? I had this amount of time in my day. I know that I have this issue that I'm dealing with, and that brother, that sister needs that love that I haven't been good at giving. Let me try to do that today. You see, that, those are, so those are some practical things that you can do just to get you started, you know. 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. The, that individual, inner, that personal animosity I feel towards somebody else, it's probably the sin in James 3 that he calls favoritism. I'm just like, I like my people, I don't like those people, yeah. and I prefer my people to those people. And it's a personal sin to be repented of, and we all have it. We all have it. If, it, if, it, if it's not based on skin tone, it's based on something. So it's something we all fight against. Uh, I think we're past time, so we're going to call it. How's that? That's fine. It's your show. Okay. <laughs> so uh, to wrap up, could we have a huge round of applause for Al? Yeah.